Last week in New Zealand, the unthinkable happened when a Pretoria mother of three allegedly murdered her three young daughters, strangling them with cable ties. The family left for the country at the end of August after immigrating from South Africa. Graham Dickerson, an orthopedic surgeon and father, arrived home from work on Thursday evening only to find their lifeless bodies. Neighbours heard him screaming and crying. Their mother, also a doctor, Lauren Dickerson, was still on the property according to police reports. She was arrested, charged with murder and has since been sent for psychiatric evaluation. I'm Amy Gibbings, journalist for News 24's multimedia department, and this is The Story. This week we'll be discussing filicide, the tragic phenomenon when a parent kills their child or children, and take a look at what might have triggered Dickerson to commit these murders. You're listening to The Story. It's a podcast by News24. We'll speak to journalists and experts about the week's biggest story. This is what we saw, heard and uncovered this week. This week we're talking to editor of Parent24, Elizabeth Mamakos. Hi Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. Could you explain to us what led up to the tragic events of that Thursday in Timaru, New Zealand, where the Dickerson family had only been living for a week, I believe? Hi Amy. So, there's a lot we don't know about the situation and it wouldn't be fair to speculate, but the facts as presented so far are that the Dickerson family made the decision to immigrate to New Zealand, a country that is notoriously tricky to get citizenship for. It appears Graham had secured a job at a hospital in Timaru, a district in the South Island of New Zealand, and upon arriving in the country, the family spent two weeks in what New Zealand calls managed isolation and quarantine. Some news outlets have suggested that the conditions in these isolation hotels are less than ideal for a stressed family with young children. The family then moved to staff quarters in Timaru, where Graham's employers had arranged accommodation near the hospital he was employed at. It's understood they'd been living in the staff quarters for just a week when Graham came home from work to find his three children dead and his wife in need of medical attention. Very soon after that, we heard that Lauren was charged with the murder of her children and that she had been sent to a secure forensic mental health facility where she will undergo a mental health assessment. Reports have also revealed that Lauren had stopped taking chronic medication for an as yet undisclosed illness, which isn't surprising in this context as it's well known that immigrants to New Zealand are subjected to medical tests and must pass certain standards to be accepted. The family may have felt that her condition and or her reliance on the medication might compromise their application. I believe she's expected to appear in court again in early October, and perhaps then we might hear more of what happened that fateful night. Some news outlets reported that Lauren had really struggled to conceive her daughters, and so it's hard to imagine that after so many years of trying to fall pregnant, she then killed her three children. What might have triggered her to do it, Elizabeth? Amy, I think it's important to realise that the very process of going through infertility treatment is in itself, for many women, traumatic. First is having to accept that you cannot naturally conceive for any number of reasons, and then having to submit to invasive or perhaps some might feel humiliating tests, injections, checkups and treatments, often at great expense and with actually quite a small guarantee of success. I believe a couple can go through about three IVF attempts before there's a successful pregnancy. So while one might think the parents really wanted the children, one must remember that perhaps the process they went through was not ideal. Then there's always the looming threat of postpartum depression or even worse, postpartum psychosis, which may manifest after a birth and which can be present for a long time afterwards. Um, Between 15 and 20% of women suffer some kind of postpartum depression and it's not a stretch to imagine that Lauren struggled with this after having twins which, in a situation like this, where a couple is facing challenges to conceive, undergoing fertility treatments, giving birth to twins, and then essentially giving up their entire support system to immigrate through the stress and isolation of the pandemic. It's not hard to imagine the stress they were under. And then, of course, there's a lot we don't know, and many other factors may have driven her to this point. Nonetheless, even with this, all of this in mind, It is hard to imagine what might have driven her to act in such a way, and this is perhaps what has captured the country's attention. Certainly. Despite this being such a shocking event, it isn't hard to imagine how much stress the family was under, particularly Lauren as the mother of three. Elizabeth, what else might drive a parent to do something like this? So in South Africa, local studies have shown that family breakdown is at the centre of this phenomenon, with high levels of violence, intimate partner violence and violence against children present. 
And that psychological explanations alone are not sufficient to explain the complexity of this issue. Sadly, in a country such as ours, where violence and crime is entrenched, we have a long way to go in reducing these horrific cases. It's interesting to note that New Zealand has an extremely low murder rate, and in fact, until last week, only two children had been confirmed killed in the country. In South Africa, our numbers are much higher. And here, three children are killed every day, and these figures may even be underreported. But we do know that parents kill their children, with several cases making headlines in recent years. It's disturbing because it goes against the natural order of things. Those are really some frightening stats, um, especially when we compare the two countries. Police in a statement said they're not seeking anyone else, so it seems like it could be a straightforward case. But in cases like this, what would happen if her attorneys put forward a plea for insanity in her defence? So, Amy, I can't speak for the justice system in New Zealand, where I believe Lauren will be tried. But in South Africa, each case is assessed on its own merits, and I'm sure the same is true in New Zealand. This means the judge weighs up the evidence and discusses the case with various experts, which I'm sure will include psychologists and anyone involved in the evaluation and observation which is currently undergoing. Now, if the defense of insanity is raised, and it can be proved that the accused did not appear to understand what he or she was doing at the time, in South Africa, then the accused might not be held criminally responsible for their actions. If it's decided that the accused lacked criminal capacity and is not fit to stand stand trial, then the criminal charges are withdrawn, although the accused might be admitted as a patient in a psychiatric facility. In a case like this with Lauren Dickerson, if it's found that she's capable and she is tried and sentenced, mitigating factors might include emotional trauma, PTSD, an existing mental health condition, and various other personal factors that might be put forward by her legal team. And this is likely, as many studies show a high frequency of depression and suicidal behavior among mothers who commit child homicide. I'd like to note that in a South African study of 32 mothers who have killed their children, in 19 of those cases a psychiatric diagnosis was made, and about half of them were found fit to stand trial. However, it might count against Dickerson that as a doctor, she had the medical knowledge and foresight to know the risks involved in stopping her chronic medication. This is assuming the medication was linked to a mental health condition. And a prosecutor might argue that this was irresponsible of her and it could possibly count as an aggravating factor in sentencing. There are also different classifications of filicide, and these include, for example, acutely psychotic filicide, unwanted child filicide, and spousal revenge filicide. In an international study of 62 revenge filicide cases, in only one was a mental health defense successful in mitigating sentence. And it's important to note that in New Zealand, there is a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment for murder with a non-parole period of at least 10 years. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time and for bringing us such interesting clarity around an event that has really captured a lot of people's attention. We're now joined by Gerda Kriel, a psychologist who specializes in parent-infant psychotherapy. Gerda, this really is an unimaginable human tragedy. Could you talk to us a bit about the phenomenon of filicide and what is typically behind these types of killings? So Amy, as we've learned this past week, filicide is the act of taking the lives of your children. And this can be committed either by a father or a mother. And there are so many different factors that could contribute, you know. So in this past week, we've realized that mental health is one of the contributing factors. In the past, we also know that um, fathers sometimes take the lives of children when they want to get back to the mother for something or vice versa. So if there's a revenge um, towards the the parent, the other parent, um, financial stress leads to that. Economic difficulties leads to filicide. Um, We know mental health issues lead to filicide. There can be so many different reasons, and I think it's something that definitely needs more attention. I think you're right. It seems that research in the field, specifically in South Africa, is is quite limited. But from a psychological point of view, it's difficult for some people to understand or empathize how come, as a general practitioner, Lauren didn't spot the signs herself, that she was clearly not coping and on the edge of doing something frightening. Yeah, so just focusing on the mental health aspect of filicide, you know, and it seems like the the Dickerson killings were probably 
we don't know and i think this is just the thing is a lot of there's a lot of speculation right now in media um about why would a mother do that and i think it's part of our collective trying to understand why would a mother take the lives of her children because we don't think of mothers as inherently people that are murderous right we think of mothers as being nurturing and kind and loving so this is uh, this killing does go against the very grain of how we think of a mother and and these lovely little children so I'm just so mindful that we need to be very careful. We don't know what her mental state was. We don't know, um, you know, exactly what her struggles were. So I'm not going to be able to answer directly on her specifically, but let's talk about a mother who has mental health issues and why mothers with mental health issues in general might be more prone to commit filicide. Um, because I think that's a much more helpful position than trying to understand why she didn't see the warning signs or did see the warning signs or whatever. The fact is that mothers are more likely than fathers to battle with mental health issues. And we also know that in South Africa specifically, there, are, there is still so much stigma attached to mental health problems that many mothers go undiagnosed. Right. So I think statistically, we're talking about about 15 to 17 percent of mothers get diagnosed with major um, with postpartum depression. But we know um, that it's most likely more close to 40 percent, but people aren't seeking treatment. There's just not they're just not accessing help. Why is that? We need to ask the question, why is that? Is it because as a society, we are very biased about the way that we think about mothers with depression or mental health challenges? Um, because, you know, we do have really great mental health services in South Africa. So, um, but again, you know, if you are living in a rural place and there is no access to mental health care, it is very, very difficult to know. If you have a, if you, if you have the knowledge, like we all know that, um, you know, Dr. Dickerson was a doctor and she had some knowledges. And so we're all thinking, well, she could have known, she should have known a bit earlier that something was amiss. Why don't we? Well, that's because when you have mental health challenges, you will try very hard to convince yourself that you are okay and that you don't need the help, all right? Because whatever the reason might be, you might feel weak um, admitting that you have help. Um, you might have, in, in their case, they've just immigrated to a new country. They didn't know people there, you know? So we don't know exactly what it was that, that stopped her from getting the help that she required. Um, and I also need to say this, like we don't know with mental health stuff, but we talk about mental health like it's just postpartum depression that people can get or that mothers can get. But there's also a very high risk for, for schizophrenia or psychosis. And a psychotic event removes you from reality, which means that no matter you know, what you're doing, you're not entirely in touch with what you are doing. So I think the short, the short and the long of this whole situation is that mothers don't feel they have the support to always say what they are going through. When a mother has dark thoughts, if she expresses them, she already experiences that people are going to be judging her thinking. And, and there's really, I, I really feel like the urge to make a call for action for mothers to start speaking up because we can prevent tragedies like this in the future, but also for communities to start saying, if you're a mom and you're not coping or you have dark thoughts, speak to us. Your dark thoughts you don't need to carry them alone. And I think that is really a message we need to start sending out. We shouldn't be normalizing um, the intention to want to take your children's lives, but we should for certain be normalizing, talking about fantasies or anger or frustration towards our children, not in a way to say, it's okay, be frustrated with your children, but no, to say, I'm so frustrated to the point where I actually might need help. So we do need to normalize conversations around maternal mental health, definitely. Gerda, I think you've um, highlighted some very important points. This particular incident, though, has really blown up. But what about all the parents in South Africa who are struggling and have little access to support? How could you tell if you as a parent or someone you know is struggling to that degree? And how does one reach out for help? You know, Amy, first of all, as a parent, I think I'm a parent myself and I understand exactly how it feels to be really overwhelmed. And it's interesting, like when we feel so overwhelmed is that we tend to not reach out, but we tend to reach inward. And as a parent, when you start feeling really like the day-to-day -day living stuff is too much for you. And day-to-day -day things such as getting your kids dressed and fed, that's a basic thing that parents should not be feeling overwhelmed with, all right? So if those kinds of things are making you feel overwhelmed, 
that is a very good indicator that something is amiss and you need to start accessing help. And that could be as simple as going to your local clinic and seeing a, a nurse there and just speaking and saying, I'm actually not coping, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, is there some treatment I could access? Is there a counselor that you can recommend I speak to? And then in that space, start speaking, like speak to a counselor or if you're rural, speak to somebody at your church. You know, I think we underestimate the value that community-based services have. Like there's definitely a medical component to um, treating, you know, mental health issues. I mean, obviously it's in the word. However, um, the under, we don't, we underestimate like the, the very beginning when you start feeling that way, what a difference community can make. So if you're a part of a community group or you are part of a group of mothers that meet regularly, opening up and speaking about your challenges, because you know, that is really how we, how we can help. Nobody's gonna know to help you with your children if they don't know that you need help. And there's this thing that we do as moms, I suppose, and I, I see this in my practice all the time as well. We need to look okay. We need to look well put together. We need to always be friendly, always be fine. But inside, women are actually in shambles. They feel like they're not coping. They're not good enough. So anything that perpetuates that feeling, you know, you really need to just identify that. Feeling ex excessive anger, feeling ex excessive anxiety, um, having dark fantasies, dark ideas that you don't know what to do with. Those are all signs. And those are all, I want to say, some of the very first signs. But start speaking and start accessing help. And, and even in your family, if you can say to a mother or an aunt or a sister or somebody, listen, I need you to please help me out. I feel like I'm not coping. Can you just help me? Can you listen to me? Can you support me? And then don't shy away from medical intervention. Goodness. Um, you know, I speak with so many people who don't want to take medication when they are depressed. And then when they eventually do, they feel so much better. You know, I tell people that depression kills as many people as heart disease, um, and, and yet we still stigmatize the use of medication for that. Um, we really, as a community, should be starting to take a more proactive stance at destigmatizing mental health issues. It's, it's not helping anybody, it's not serving anybody if we're not allowing people to actually access the help they have because they're afraid of being stigmatized. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Gerda, and, and for that really valuable advice. That was psychologist Gerda Creel. That's all we have time for this week. I'm Amy Gibbings.